Good day, and um, here we are. How many times have I said that over the last little while? Um, thank you for having me with you, wherever you are, listening to the message uh, that we have from the scriptures today. just want to thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time. And um, we want to spend some time now in uh, Timothy's, the uh, letter to Timothy, pardon me, from Paul, we are continuing in that series, What is the Church? We're now moving into chapter 6, the first two verses, which I'll just tell you right off the bat, are um, um, really join the conversation that happens in chapter 5. But other than that, let's start with a scene. I want to describe a scene to you uh, from World War II. Not a Hollywood movie scene, but a real scene that actually happened during World War II. It was when the Allies advanced across Europe, east and west, toward uh, the center of Germany, or to Germany. Uh, they came across, and this is the latter stages of the war, they came across uh, and encountered in concentration camps that the Nazis had put in place. And there they found prisoners, many, many prisoners by the scores, dead or starving and sick. And camp after camp, the Allies encountered these horrendous scenes. The British forces uh, liberated Bergen-Belsen on the 15th of April, 1945. And there they found an overcrowded camp filled with, or littered with, thousands of dead bodies. And of those that were remained alive, approximately 60,000 were starving and suffering from deadly diseases. And the mortality rate for one of those diseases, typhus, was more than 60%. And among these kinds of uh, atrocities that the Nazi, Nazi regime implemented were the countless prisoners used really as slaves to feed their machine, their, their war machine. And they were slaves and they were used for those purposes that is, until they were not useful anymore, and they would probably be killed or sent to the concentration camps. Now, when you consider this whole um, thing about slaves, or idea about slaves or a slave, the Nazi regime, its very basic principle, uh, was no different than the prevailing thought, for example, of the, of the ancients. Ancient philosophers uh, such as Aristotle and Plato, when speaking of slaves, uh, called them lifeless things uh, and living tools. Now we fast forward here to our time, the 21st century, and one would think we have come a long way from those ancients in regards to uh, how they handled slaves or slavery in regimes like the Nazis. But let me introduce you to a Christian ministry called the Agape International. And their mission is simply this, to quote them, quote, to care and love the survivors of human trafficking and exploited individuals. And according to them, Agape International, they estimate that around 40 million people worldwide are in what they identify as modern day slavery. And out of those 40 million, these are some really Astonishing facts. Out of those 40 million, one out of four are children. And of these, approximately 4.8 million are trafficked for sex. And those that are trafficked for sex, 99% of those victims are women and girls. Now, having said all this, let me say this. I think we can see this in our human person, our human being. Inherent to all human beings is the desire for freedom. It's the way we're wired. This is true not only in the past and in our day, but we think about it in our day-to-day -day lives as well. For example, who does not desire freedom from debt? Or freedom from the overreach of government policies? that come to us from time to time, that threaten our freedoms. Friends, freedom is the heart cry of all people through all the ages. Yet one biblical commentator said this about 
this inherent uh, freedom that is in all of us, desire for freedom. Quote, many discover that the road to freedom is a hard one and that freedom carries with it new constraints and responsibilities that are often more frustrating than any previously endured. Now, having said this, please turn in your Bibles to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. That's where we're going to be today. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is, this is a continuing part of the conversation or the exhortations that Paul is giving to Timothy in chapter 5. So I'm just going to read those two verses. Uh, you want to read it in context, of course, when you read it yourself. But for today, read with me verse 1 and 2 of chapter 6. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have, those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us now by your spirit to understand uh, what we are learning here in this text and also how it will be applied to in our lives day by day. We thank you and we pray this brings you great glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As we consider the subject of slavery, it is indeed an emotional one. You know, when you consider the evil that, br that this brings, this, this brings to even the youngest of our society, uh, it is normal for us to have a spontaneous emotional response, a righteous indignation, if you will. And today, as we consider what Paul called here in the first verse, the yoke of slavery, in his context, we need for a moment to set aside our emotions. We need to and want to get some objective understanding here. So we have to do that hard work. So we need to put on uh, our first century hats, even though we certainly aren't a first century people. We know that Paul wrote to Timothy, his co-worker in the gospel, who was pastoring a church that was struggling in many ways. We've talked about that a number of times over the course of this series. Um, they were dealing with all sorts of things inside the church and certainly uh, dealing with the societal issues at the same time. And these two verses, as I mentioned, are located in the context of this whole letter. What do we know about the fellowship of believers at the time of Paul's letter? Well, we know how it was started. The book of Acts provides us with some information about that. The gospel was likely first brought to Ephesus by two people that we find in the book of Acts called Priscilla and Aquila during Paul's second missionary journey. And Paul then would return a third time and pastor the church for three years. And after he departed from Ephesus, he left Timmy, Timmy, sure, Timmy, pardon me, Timothy behind to deal with a few men of influence who were teaching their false dogmas, causing disorder and just total, you know, not total, but confusion within the church. And Paul's letter also gives us some other insights. If you've been tracking, we've, we've heard of some of these things. For example, the Ephesian church was a multi-generational church. All the seasons of life were represented in their fellowship. The Ephesian church was also diverse in its representation of the social economic conditions of its day in the first century. The rich and the poor, side by side, uh, worshiping and serving together. When we consider the surrounding religious culture of Ephesus of the day, this would also be represented in the church and by the fact that number of, no doubt a number of the people in the church were at one time worshipers of Artemis, which was there located in Ephesus, the temple of Artemis. So as we look at our text today, we would also include here in that early church in Ephesus those who were slaves and those who were slave masters. Now we need to get a little grasp about what 
what that was like or what that meant for sure in the Roman society of Paul's day. And with the help of the IVB commentary, we, got some, we, can, we can have some ideas. When we think of slaves, we understand that this was a distinct group in Roman society. Although they were obviously considered property and would be so treated by that, by their masters, in, in day-to-day life, this would not have prevented many from having a great deal of freedom and mobility. Slaves could earn a living and even be in joint partnership uh, with their masters. Slaves could hold positions of authority in businesses or in a variety of administrative roles in the lower levels of government, probably in the in municipal government of the day. They could receive, and many would receive, a very good education, and slaves could also attain their freedom by their good service to their masters. So it appears, at least, we have a hint or a clue here. At the time of Paul's uh, letter in the first century there, conditions for slaves seem to be improving. Now, now this is just a guess, but it certainly seems that from the information that we gather. Paul's gospel, though, we need to understand, brought to the Ephesian church an alternative, alternative option for slaves. And maybe some may have seen uh, this as an opportunity or a more direct route to their freedom. You see, Paul's gospel was what Jesus said, and Jesus said this, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, that is Jesus, you will be free indeed. You, so this kind of brings up a question that we need to ask. Did Jesus, did Paul, did Timothy, the New Testament writers condone and endorse slavery? Well, right off the bat, short answer, no. We see this even in the way the Apostle Paul handled that in, his, uh, in this letter, 1 Timothy, in the first chapter where he said that slave traders were also breaking the law of God. They were rebels. You find that in the first chapter. Check it out for yourself. Then there springs up another question. Why were they not more vocal about this societal issue, slavery? Why were they not more radical in their approach? Again, we need to think about this in the first century context. You know, slaves were, as we are learning, an integral part of Roman society and their commerce, of their economy. They were not only seen as property, which they were, according to their ideas, but also a vital factor in the economy, as mentioned, and the stability of the Roman Empire and for the peace of the empire. So much so was this ingrained in the culture, in the Roman society, that any insurrection or opposition to slavery would have been squashed by the Romans. So let me just present this scene. Uh, around 73 BC, there was a fellow by the name of Spartacus. Yes, there was a movie about that. And there, apparently there's a TV show. I caught a bit of that. I would not uh, uh, guarantee that that's a good one to watch. But anyway, Spartacus was a Thracian. And historically, it's hard to pinpoint when Spartacus became a slave, but a slave he did become. And Spartacus was a trained gladiator. So he was a trained in... Uh, the art of combat. And in 73 BC, Spartacus and a number of slaves, we're not, not sure how many, escaped. They defeated the soldiers that came to capture them and then began, became very successful in recruiting other slaves to their cause. Not just gladiators, but uh, city slaves and country slaves and slaves right across the area. Now, their cause wasn't necessarily what you might consider. They did loot, they did steal, they did kill. But anyways, they, they grew to such an army of about 70,000 or so 
by 71 BC. And they actually defeated two Roman armies, sent their way two legions. Yet we know that it was only a matter of time before the superior Roman military might succeeded in defeating Spartacus and that slave army in 71 BC. And folks, the reprisal was swift and it was deadly. Approximately 6,000 survivors were crucified, lining the Appian Way roadway from Rome to Capua, or Capua, approximately 190 kilometers. Let's get back to the church in Ephesus. What was Paul's concern for the church? And if you've been tracking with us, and if you read the letter, you see that throughout his letter, Paul wants, his, wants the church to maintain an attitude of untarnished Christian witness. That if the gospel was associated with social upheaval, it would have been seen as a threat to the peace and order of society. And by the way, as history has shown, not only in Roman times, this is a common accusation brought upon Christians, even today in our context. See, for Paul, the gospel of Jesus that brings salvation to the sinner was not to be confused with the kingdoms of the world. But there's more. Think about this. Changing society does not bring salvation to a person. Salvation through Jesus Christ is what will change a society, one person at a time. Revolution does not cure the disease. And what is the disease? It's sin. It's in the heart of every person. And unless people deal with their relationship with God, any change in society's ills for the positive, which often happen, will not last. They will not endure the test of time. And the tragedies, such as human trafficking of children and others today around the world, the mass shootings that we see in schools, will be destined for, to repeat themselves. And Paul understood this, folks. He understood this because he knew the, what the gospel of Jesus Christ could do to the human heart and thereby do to the human family. He knew that all, it all begins in the heart that is changed by God via the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the cross of Christ is the great leveler, if you will, of all people. For as we see here in these two verses, the oppressed... The slaves and the oppressor are sitting side by side, worshiping God together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, or as Paul calls them, called them here, fellow believers. And in verse 1, we find slaves who had come to Christ apart from their masters. That's the first uh, indication here in verse 1. These were Christian slaves of unbelieving masters. And anyone under the pastoral leadership of Paul or Timothy or understand the scriptures would soon learn that their faith in Jesus Christ has brought them new freedom. We see this in the letter that Paul wrote to the Galatian church when he said, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened against by a yoke of slavery. A yoke of slavery. What was that yoke of slavery? Well, if you read on in uh, verse 2 and on, it's sin. Paul also said in the same Galatian letter this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the family of God through Christ. And then we think about the Ephesian church and what was going on there. It's reasonable to presume, presume that Paul's teaching would have found its way back to the master of the household. And as you, we have already learned that this kind of teaching, the freedom that we have in Christ, would have been seen as radical. We also need to realize that the religion of the household of that day, each household, was decided by the master of that household who would determine the religion of the whole household, including the slaves. And it would be 
uh, reasonable to presume because of their freedom in Christ, their worship of Christ and not the, the gods of the culture, that they would bring some tension there. Especially if the Christian slave, filled with the hope of freedom beyond the spiritual context at the time, will begin to treat their master disrespectfully, become disrespectful to their master. Remember, it's Paul's concern not to tarnish the name of Christ. Even Paul himself describes his willingness to endure suffering for the cause of Christ. And he calls this, so that God's word is not chained. And Paul acknowledged in that those under the yoke, here we the yoke of slavery here in verse 1, and their pagan masters, it would be a difficult and somewhat complicated relationship. That they were to continue to obey them because they were accountable to someone higher, higher than the emperor, higher than the pagan gods. We see this in his letter to the Colossae, to Colossae, the church at Colossae, where he said, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you to, and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And if you think about it in our context, we can do a direct relationship with the employer-employee relationship to work at that job or at that employment because you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But pastor, you might ask, what about the master or even the employer who treated their slaves or their employee poorly? That's a very good point. What about that? We go back to Paul to finish this teaching or his teaching. Anyone, the same letter, Colossian letter, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs. And there is no favoritism. Think about this. The key word here is anyone. So this would include the slaves who done wrong, and this would include the master who does wrong. This would include the employee who does wrong. This would include the employer who does wrong. For God shows no favoritism. God is sovereign. God knows all and will judge rightly in all those cases. So let's just wrap this first piece off. Verse 1 from another commentary from Paul from his Roman letter. When he said this, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become, God, become slaves of God, keep that in mind, slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I say amen to that. Now we move into verse 2. Here we see that great leveling factor. And what is it? Remember, the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's read verse 2 together. Those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. What does that mean? Here we have Christian slaves and their believing masters living in the same household. You want to check out the book of Philemon. It'll give you a good example of that. Again, it's reasonable to presume that this relationship between two believers in, these opposing, in this opposing power structure came with its own set of difficulties. And I really think it's hard for us to imagine that, especially here where I live in Alberta, in Canada, in, in North America, at least in Canada, United States, it's hard for us to manage, manage how to picture this, understand this. It doesn't seem to compute. So let me just share an example that would be similar in a number of ways. In the Canadian Armed Forces, the, the way they work, the way that it works is within what's called a command structure. It's called the chain of command. And in this structure, the chain of command, you have the non-commissioned officers. And then above those, you have the commissioned officers. 
These are the ones responsible for providing direction to the non-commissioned officers. And within each of these segments in the chain of command are superiors and subordinates. To put it simply, anyone that is one rank above yours is your superior, and anyone that is one rank below yours is your subordinate. For example, the private, that's in the non-commissioned officers segment, is at the bottom of the chain. Everyone above a private is superior. The corporal next in the chain is subordinate to their superior, the sergeant, and so forth, and so on. In the officer rank, let's start with the captain rank. The captain is subordinate to the major, who is subordinate to the colonel, who is subordinate to the general. That's how it works in the Canadian Armed Forces. Now imagine with me that you have a general who is a Christian and a private who is a Christian worshipping and serving in the same church. If I was the private, do I call the general by his first name while we worship together and sir the moment I step out into the parking lot? Outside the church, the private and the general will most likely never see each other at work, for sure, or even work with each other. Generals don't tend to hang out with privates, and privates don't tend to hang out with generals. They would not work with each other. They would not share the same social circles outside of the church, outside of the fellowship of believers. Yet they are equal, equal before the cross. And as Paul said, they are fellow believers. Let's stick with the military theme. If you are a Christian and someone who is your superior, now we're in the military here, gives you direction and you treat them with, with disrespect, what do you think would happen? And if this continues and is not resolved and you were uh, the unbelieving superior who knew that the one not following your orders, who was being condescending, who was being disrespectful, was a Christian, what would you think? Paul said, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect. Why? Paul goes on, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Let me ask you this. If both the superior and the subordinate are Christians, as in the example of the German, uh, the German, <laughs> sorry, German, uh, the general who is a Christian and the private is a Christian, and the subordinate disrespects their superior, what do you think? Paul said, instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. Again, going back here to the very beginning as we introduce some of this, it's really my gut feeling that this has not answered any of our questions concerning the atrocities of our day, concerning the human trafficking and all those things. These are hard things for us to understand and as followers of Christ, how to navigate that world, to process it. It often leaves us feeling hopeless and maybe angry and maybe rightly so angry and so more, quest more wise in questions than answers. You know, there's not much to offer outside of what Christ offers, his peace. He said, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Does this mean we do nothing? We sit around and watch it happen? No, we engage, we engage. We want to be part of the solution. We want, to, we want to be part of the solution for sure. We want to love those who are hurt. We want to support them. We want to pray for them. But it's still not, not going to happen overnight, is it? Let me offer some other things to take away. Well, maybe the first one, in a small way, to help you answer maybe the why question. I'm going to butcher this guy's name, but Alexander Solzhenitsyn, was a Russian novelist and a dissident who suffered brutally under Stalin in the gulags. And he said this, if I were called upon, if I were called upon 
to identify briefly the principal trade of the entire 20th century. I would be unable to find anything more precise and pithier than to repeat once again, men have forgotten God. You see, friends, God has been cancelled in our 21st century context in many places. And then when this happens, all hell breaks loose at Robb Elementary School, Uvaldale, Texas. Two, Jesus said this, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Friends, if you are a true believer, you are free, even if your social, economic, and political context is not. Three, Paul said in his letter to the Romans, now that you've been set free from sin, and have become slaves of God. Remember, I asked you to remember that. You have become slaves of God. Bob Dylan, long time ago, wrote, God has served somebody. And then one line goes like this, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord. You're going to serve somebody. And I want to close by saying this statement, as hard as it might sound, all Christians are slaves. All Christians are slaves. We are called to serve God with all our strength, with all our mind, with all that we are. And we're called to serve all, to love all, to be engaged in bringing the love of God to all. Service is what this is all about in this whole two verses here. As hard as it is to deal with the atrocities and the hard things that we have faced today, such as human trafficking. We are slaves to God and to serve others, to bring hope, to bring freedom from sin, eternal life. Give eternal life. God will give you eternal life. So thank you very much for paying attention. Lord, we thank you for all these things. We praise you thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good day. Shalom.